social media valuations have been pretty much going through the roof lately. You look at the what, $50 billion figure put on Facebook, $3 billion or more put on Groupon. How do venture capitalists determine what the next big thing will be? Well, our next guest has a keen eye for talent. He was one of the first investors in Twitter. He's currently a board member there. We're joined by Bijan Sabat. He's general partner at Spark Capital. Bijan, welcome to In Business. You've had a busy week here. Take a look at this rundown of your deals. You uh, invested in Stack Exchange, which is more or less a Q&A site. You invested in Kick, which is another form of messaging. And you were an investor in Next New Networks, which was just purchased by YouTube. Uh, it, are you just on a streak here? <laughs> yeah, we actually announced another one this week, too, called Group Commerce, uh, which we're very excited about. They announced a partnership with the New York Times company and, and a number of other publishers. And uh, that's founded by David Rosenblatt, who was the founder of uh, DoubleClick. So it's another one that uh, we were very excited to announce this week. Oh, wow. Well, you know, there's plenty of, of buzz out there about some of the dollar amounts being put on these deals. Um, from your perspective, how happy are you with the returns on investments like Next New Networks? Yeah, we're, we're very happy. I mean, Next New Networks um, is, is a great company. You know, it, it was a, in a way, it was a very natural acquisition for Google's YouTube um, product team to buy Next New Networks. They're very complementary. Uh, Next New Networks and YouTube have been work, working together for a long time in terms of how you know emerging uh, artists and creators um, build audiences and build monetization on on the YouTube platform. Um, so it just felt like a very natural acquisition. Many times though it's you get kind of mixed feelings when a big company buys uh, one of our startups. I mean that that does happen and it's it, it provides a nice reward for people but also you know we've been working closely with these companies for quite a while so now it belongs to somebody else and it's a little bit uh, you know, it feels a little like, you know, there's mixed feelings for sure, but, it, but it's an exciting thing for the employees and, and uh, we're very happy. You know, we hear the term bubble used quite frequently now when we're talking about startups on, out in Silicon Valley. How do you characterize valuation levels these days? You know, they're definitely higher, but in many cases, I think the best companies deserve the valuations. I think the word bubble has a has a has a tough ring to it because it it comes back to the the first bubble and then the the first bust um, that we had, you know, more than a decade ago. And you know, I think many things have changed since then. You know, in that first you know bubble, you know, you had lofty valuations for companies that didn't deserve it. Frankly, mm -hmm. they were not, they didn't have underlying sound principles. They were buying Super Bowl ads without having a business model underneath. Um, they were spending tens of millions of dollars even before they launched the product. Um, you know, so I think that bubble is very different than what we're seeing today. So there's no question that the very best companies, you know, the category leaders are getting a lot of attention and big valuations, but these companies are growing very fast. Are They're you talking about revenue. Facebook here primarily? I'm talking about Facebook, Zynga, Twitter, LinkedIn, Groupon. I mean, the best companies are growing extremely fast, almost logarithmic, and, and their revenue is growing very fast too. You know, in the first bubble, we didn't have that. You know, we didn't have revenue. <laughs> we just had, uh, you know, people were buying audience. They didn't have an organic audience base. We didn't have things like iPhones that were creating, you know, massive distribution opportunities. So I, I just feel like the word bubble is, is the wrong word for what we see right now. I think many companies today that are getting high valuations are getting it because they're worth it. Uh, well, we also have that secondary market out there, right? And I mean, right. Right. let's talk about Twitter. You just mentioned it. Do you value Twitter at the 7.7 .7 billion that Shares Post does? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about, frankly, about shares post and how, how it does it. I do know that when, when shares move on those secondary markets, they're typically, it's not often the case, but it's typically done in relatively low volume. Right. So, you know, it's it's hard to kind of use that as the as the benchmark. But, you know, Twitter has been, you know, raising capital from, you know, professional institutional investors. Like we just raised a couple hundred million dollars last fall from Kleiner Perkins, you know, one of the best venture capital firms ever. And... Um, and, you know, we all felt like it was a very fair valuation, but it was, you know, several billions of dollars, um, you know, uh, value for the company. And, um, and that put your value you know, at was, around was, like four billion, didn't it? Yeah, it was closer to four. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and you find that more accurate of a reading than than shares post or, or some of the other secondary markets. You, you don't put too much stock, in other words, in what they're valuing. 
No, I, I, I don't mean to say that. I, I, I think the value of Twitter is significantly higher than, than when we raised money with Kleiner Perkins because the company has grown significantly even since last fall. But I, I just try not to get too obsessed about a single trade that happens on SharePost because as far as I know, the volume is relatively small. Right. You know, so, you know, if, if today Apple spikes or dips or something, that's very different than, you know, if somebody sells 5,000 shares of Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter on a secondary market. Sure. And we've got more visibility, as, as you say, um, in right. pointing to, to the revenue. There's been a lot of press attention in the past few weeks. I know you're a Twitter board member, so maybe you can clear the air here. Um, JP Morgan it was putting together that fund to uh, acquire and invest in uh, social media. What would a stake in Twitter that they're reported to be taking do for the company? Well, you know, the, one of the co-founders of Twitter, um, Biz Stone, recently, you know, announced, uh, I think to Reuters or somebody like that, um, that the, the rumors about J.P. Morgan buying a position at Twitter was false. And, you know, as far as I know, um, it, it still remains to be false. So I, I don't I don't know who first reported that story. I know it caught a lot of uh, momentum. But, um, you know, as far yeah. as I know, there's no discussion with J.P. Morgan to sell them any, any Twitter stock. Yeah, that was unclear whether he was also saying that about uh, J.P. Morgan's report being false or the reports of looking at IPO. What do you know about that? Oh, yeah, that? We, we, it, it's it's right. We have no plans for an IPO. It, the company's uh, not focused on that at all. Uh, we're just focused on, on uh, our, you know, running our business. Why is that? I mean, what's, what's the value in, in staying private these days? You know, I think that the reason why companies go public is, you know, for a variety of reasons. I think one natural reason is to provide liquidity for shareholders and founders and employees um, and, you know, and to also raise money to accomplish the company's goals. In the case of Twitter, you know, we haven't needed to worry about going public to raise the capital we need to uh, support the company's, you know, re capital requirements. So, you know, there's been a lot of demand for the stock in the private markets with private institutional investors. So we've been able to raise money at what we think are fair terms. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to go to the public market and have to deal with all the um, overhead of, of being a publicly held company. I think we're still in the early days of, of this company and, and there's no rush um, to, to take this company public. We have to wrap it up here, but very quick question to you. I mean, what did the use of, of Twitter in the social protests and uprisings in the Mideast do in any way to valuations? I mean, is that changing? You're finding the way people look at Twitter or other companies? Well, I think all these um, services have, have, you know, been utilized. I, I try not to overhype whether, you know, I, I, you know, these are just tools and services. I think the people of those countries are, are the thing that we should pay more attention to than the technology. But certainly, I think all this attention on, on Twitter and, and Facebook with all the stuff happening in the Middle East, you know, more people have signed up mm -hmm. um, and, you know, more people visit the site and, you know, use their apps on their phones and all that. But, you know, I, 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 I think that uh, more attention should be placed on, on the people of those regions than, than some of the technology companies that are being used. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much okay. for coming out. All right. Business. Thanks a lot. Great to talk to you.